Hello. Uh, and thank you for coming to the uh, Hopkinton Senior Center for um, this uh, installment of the presentations that I've been doing here now for, I think, five or six years. Um, and my name is Arthur Bergeron, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell, which allows everybody to really specialize in what they really like doing. And I really like doing elder law. My oldest, my median client age is 74. My youngest client, I think now is 55, <laughs> or actually, I have no clients under 55. So um, what I try to do each year when I come back for the, for the first one or two presentations that I do is to kind of give you an update on what has changed. And typically I frame that as what has changed in the law um, and so in 2018, there were some changes that occurred last year, so I wanted to talk about that. But I also wanted to talk about kind of what I learned this year, because uh, even more sometimes in changes in the law, you find you get situations that happen. People show up and there's this kind of unusual situation, and you find yourself saying, well, how would we deal with that? And that has changed some of the ways that I've been dealing with folks. And so I want to talk about that too. So, You've, you've, uh, if you've been here before, you know my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They're the couple that, they're the couple that I always use uh, as my example, and I always tell them that th they have a very simple goal in life. Uh, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And if, they both, if one of them has died, they want to leave everything to the other one. If they're both dead, they want to leave things to their kids. That probably all sounds familiar. Um, and so they, when they co folks come to me and talk to me, they're really talking to me about these four questions. They want to deal with life. They want to deal with death, they want to deal with life after death, and they want to deal with what remains. Um, often they think that they prim primarily are there to talk about what remains, which is always an interesting conversation, the estate planning after you're, regarding after you're both dead. But a lot of times the more significant issues are really kind of what happens while you're both alive. Um, dealing with life, um, dealing with the bank issues and doctor issues and dealing with how to deal with your house, dealing with uh, the IRS, um, those are really important issues. And you know, the stuff that, that happens after you're both dead, you're both going to be dead, right? Which, which means, and in, in, in very few theories of what happens after you both die, do you really care at that point about what is really happening to any of these other things? So we really want to talk a little bit about dealing with life. And I tell people when they come in, I often end the conversation. I had two different sets of new clients yesterday who wanted talking about long, more long-term stuff. And I said, well, you know, the really important stuff is make sure these things are taken care of while you're alive. And you've probably heard of those. You want a health care proxy. You want a medical authorization, so-called HIPAA authorization and a power of attorney. You've probably all talked about health care proxy and power of attorney and not the HIPAA authorization. I want to talk about that a little bit more because of something that I learned this year. So health care proxy is very straightforward. You need two witnesses. Um, you can name anybody. Um, you, you need to be over 18. You need to not be crazy. Uh, a copy of a healthcare proxy is okay to use. So oftentimes I tell people when you've done your healthcare proxy, give it to your doctor so your doctor can scan it in so that if you go to the hospital, um, he, can simply send, he or she can simply send it over to the hospital. One of the reasons for that is um, your proxy is always, is, is always revoked if you do a new proxy. So if you go to the hospital, to the emergency room, because you've got a problem, and they say, oh, well, you know, you really can't be admitted unless you sign this. And that is a healthcare proxy, because they want to make sure while you're there that if you become incapacitated for whatever reason, there's somebody they can call. But if you sign their healthcare proxy, what you just did was you revoked your other one, the one that you have in your house, you know, that you thought was your official healthcare proxy. So it, typically, that's why it's best in that situation to be able to say, well, you know, we'll have my doctor um, you know, email that a copy over. Um, you, can all, you're, you can always revoke your health care proxy if you disagree with it. And by the way, if you disagree with a medical decision that is re made regarding you, even if the doctor has already said that you're incompetent to make a medical decision, disagreeing with that decision automatically revokes the proxy. Automatically, there's a case law in that. Um, and, and so, for example, if you're in a room with the doctor and, the doc, and, and your proxy and the doctor says, should we operate? And your proxy says, no. And you say, yeah, I want to operate. S saying that revokes the proxy, right? Makes you back in charge. And if the doctor wasn't, doesn't want to oper operate at that point, he has to step out of the case. 
Um, so it, that part's important. And for purposes of revoking, you're presumed competent. You're always presumed competent. Okay? Now, the reason why you want to do this is because the alternative to this is a guardianship. I was talking recently to a, a woman who uh, does a lot of the planning at uh, Milford Hospital who was talking about a case that they've got, you know, that they, 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 were, they were, and they don't know what to do. Your person came to the hospital, didn't have a proxy, didn't have, you know, other, other folks to talk to. And they're, and they're like, she was saying at this particular meeting, well, you know, we kind of, we've got this person, we're kind of stuck with them because until we get a guardian named who can make, it, make a decision for him or authorize us to do something. So it really can be problematic. So, the, by the way, the, 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 when, the, when the doctor is making that determination that, um, um, that, it, that the healthcare proxy is being invoked, that's a make-believe term, invoked. Everyone uses it, it's not in the law any place. If the doctor is making that decision, he is saying that you lack the capability to make or communicate healthcare decisions. And the proxy does not kick in until the doctor has made that determination. And when the doctor makes that determination, all that happens is the healthcare proxy kicks in. Nothing else happens. Um, you are not deemed to be incompetent. You are not deemed to be incapable of doing other things, signing a will, signing a power of attorney, signing other documents, right? All that's happening is, it, is that the healthcare proxy from then on can make the decision for you regarding healthcare decisions. Um, the other thing, by the way, that you really want to be thinking about when you do a healthcare proxy, um, and I'm mentioning the Honoring Choices um, program, and I spoke about this last fall, is doing some kind of written health care directive to the person who is your proxy to help them out, just to help them out. This is not a binding document. Your health care proxy gets to do whatever the health care proxy wants to do regarding your care. Um, uh, so-called living wills are not binding in Massachusetts. However, it's a tremendous gift to the person who's going to be making this decision, these decisions for you, if they have a sense of what you consider to be important. And not, not particular instructions, you know, don't do this or do that, but what do you think is important about living? Um, what do you think is so important about the quality of your life that if you didn't have those things that you could do anymore, you wouldn't want your proxy on your behalf to be saying, oh, well, you know, we found out that he's got, you know, pneumonia, we want to bring him to the hospital. We, you know, it, it, there may be a set of things that you don't want. And remember, when you're thinking about your proxy, most people think about their healthcare proxy as, as it, the classic, you know, I'm on the floor in the house, you know, and, you know, should I get revived? You know, these are the kind of emergency things. Your healthcare proxy may be making decisions for you for a year, you know, if you have a stroke, you become incapacitated, can't make a decision. There could be a whole series of things, decisions that have to be made regarding you for a long time. You want your proxy to know in that regard what's important to you, okay? Um, your HIPAA authorization. So as I mentioned, your proxy only kicks in at the time that the doctor has said that you can't make a decision, which means that your proxy does not have the authorization to talk to your doctor or to get any of your medical records until that has happened. So if you're in the kind of standard situation where you're going to the hospital, you name your daughter as the, as the, health, as the, uh, as the proxy, and you're just sick, you're not, the doctor hasn't invoked the proxy, you're just sick, but you want your doctor to deal with the doctor in the hospital, well technically she can't and they can't talk to her unless you've also done a separate document, a, a medical authorization form, a so-called HIPAA authorization, simply authorizing your daughter in that case to talk to them, to talk to the doctor. And, and, so, and if you've got a set of kids, you know, you may want to give that authorization to everybody, even though your proxy, there can only be one proxy serving at one time, because the doctor only wants to have to talk to one person regarding your, making your medical decisions. But you could give that authorization to all your kids so that they can talk to your, your, the medical professionals about your situation. So something new that happened in 2017 is the CARE Act, uh, which was passed in 2016 in Massachusetts, came into effect. Uh, CARE, they, everybody's got initials for all this stuff. It's a Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act, or the CARE Act. What it does, it only applies when you go to the hospital. And what it says is, if you're at the hospital, the hospital has to tell you that you have the right to designate a caregiver. 
It could be the person you've named in your proxy or not. It could be a family member or not. But whoever you name, before you get discharged, that person has to be notified. Now, you know, we are all aware of this whole issue with you go to the hospital and, God, they're pushing you out the door. You know, well, you don't, sometimes people get pushed out the door to their house, but the person who's going to be taking care of them hasn't been told yet, you know. So now this person has to be notified, has to be given a copy of your care plan when you get discharged. And if any of that, <clears throat> if any of the care plan involves the caregiver needing to do something, needing to, to do something regarding a wound or any kind of pill, anything, then, then the hospital is required to train you, the, proc, the, the caregiver, regarding that so that you'll be ready to take care of mom or dad or, who, or your spouse, whoever is coming home, um, and do what the plan has in it. Now, once again, that caregiver isn't necessarily your proxy agent. So you can, you can use that person, but it doesn't have to be that person. And the caregiver isn't automatically your proxy agent. So it, by virtue of your having a proxy, you are not ordering the hospital to co communicate with that person and make sure that, that they know what's going to be going on when you go home. Okay? So it's a separate standalone law. Only applies to hospitals, not nursing homes uh, or assisted livings or other facilities. Power of attorney. It's the other document you have to have. So what do you need? No, you don't need witnesses uh, if, as, if as long as they're only doing things in Massachusetts. It may be that there are, if you've got property out of state, I have, often have people who own something in New Hampshire or in, in New Jersey or in, in, in Florida. In all of those places, witnesses are required. So you may want in that case to have witnesses, but you don't have to have, you don't have, to not have a notary. But I always recommend it. Um, why is that? Because the person deciding whether your power of attorney is valid isn't like a lawyer or a doctor who would know when the, it's legally valid. It's like the guy at the bank who, you, you know, you're going in to saying, well, you know, my, 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 my wife or my parent or whatever is, is, is sick, and so I want to sign checks. And the guy at the bank's going, well, I don't know if this power of attorney looks valid, you know. So you have to convince that person, right? And you don't want to be arguing with that person, right? And I, it has been my experience, I've been practicing now for 41 years, that documents with notarizations, everyone goes, ooh, that's a legal document. It's notarized. So you're getting the notarization, not because that makes it legal, because it, but because it makes people think it's legal. And that's important. And so that's why you, you would be doing it. Now, regarding the power of attorney as opposed to the health care proxy, um, you can name more than one person at a time. So you can oftentimes will have someone name their spouse and their child or two of their kids jointly and severally on that, on that power of attorney. Legally, that gives either person the ability to act on your behalf. So if somebody's not around, the other person can do it. Okay? Um, and that's powers of attorney. Now, re remember, and by the way, once again, stepping back, I've mentioned this. Going back to the healthcare proxy, if, if you are determined to be incapable of making a medical decision uh, under the healthcare proxy law, that determination was, this is from the law, solely for the purpose of empowering an agent to make healthcare decisions pursuant to a healthcare proxy. My added words, nothing else, nothing else. Which me, so, so the fact that you, and by the way, I mention this because n like nobody at the hospital or at the nursing home gets this. You, everybody is going to assume that if your proxy, not everybody, just about everybody, that if the proxy has been invoked and the doctor has said that you, you can't make a medical decision, it's going to be, these people are going to say, oh, they, they can't, that person can't sign a new power of attorney. That person can't sign a deed. The proxy has been invoked. They are all wrong. The only person that can decide whether you're competent to make those decisions ultimately is a judge. And in the short run is the person, typically if there's a notary, the person who's notarizing the document, is deciding whether or not, and, 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 and swearing to it, whether or not you know what you're doing when you're signing that document, right? So, so I just mention that because folks often assume they can't do anything else at that point. That's significant for, in, because of the couple of the cases that I want to talk about. And this is, some, this is, as they say, something that I learned this year. So we're assuming, um, when I talk about Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., the three kids, that they're all really nice people, right? So, but what if, if Peter's not so nice, right? 
And Paul and Mary Jr. are really nice, right? And so in, in that situation, what happens? So here are the facts. This is one that happened this year. Mary's died. Frank had appointed Peter before, the oldest, oldest son, as the alternate on the power of attorney in the healthcare proxy. So now Peter is acting both in both, in both capacities. Um, Frank has, has moved into assisted living. He's actually moved into the memory unit in assisted living. He's ha having some memory problems. He's basically competent, but you know, he's got, he's got some issues. Has, he's pretty forgetful. Uh, Peter sold the house. As to where the proceeds went, no one really knows. Um, um, Pete, the doctor has invoked the health care proxy and said that the, that the father really doesn't have the capacity to make medical decisions. Uh, and Peter, at this point, refuses to allow Paul or Mary any access to any of the medical records, um, refuses to give them any financial information regarding how, how dad is doing, both regarding what happened to the house proceeds and also to the bank accounts and the investment account, which, by the way, had a million dollars in it. Um, and they even are refusing to allow Paul and Mary Jr. to visit Frank in the assisted living. And the assisted living facility is like buying into all of this stuff, right? And so Paul and Mary Jr. come to me. What can Paul and Mary do? This is, this is an, un, an unusual thing, but not like a rare thing. This happens, you know? You've probably all seen family dysfunction that sounds a lot like this, right? What can they do? Well, first of all, you need, what you need to know is Elder abuse is not a crime, and elder abuse is not a cause of action. People will often come in and say, in this situation, isn't this elder abuse? And I'll say, well, what does that mean? And of course, you know, <laughs> no. And the answer, and the reason for that is because it isn't. It, the elder abuse is a term that's bandied about a lot, but there's no such thing as the crime of elder abuse. There's a crime hitting somebody is a crime, you know, stealing from them is a crime, but elder abuse is not a crime nor is it a cause of action. I can't sue somebody, whether it's a, person, the, the, a salesman that's come to my house and sold me something I didn't want, or one of my kids, or somebody else, and say, this was elder abuse, and so you owe me damages. That doesn't exist. You can sue them and say, once again, you stole money, or you hurt me, you know, there was a, it was assault and battery, and that gets damages. But elder abuse doesn't mean anything. So, one of the things, so we were talking to, to Paul and I said, so here are some things that you could do. I mean, one of the issues, while Peter has the proxy and the proxy has been invoked regarding medical decisions, Frank still has the ability to authorize Paul and Mary to get access to the medical records, right? Because he hasn't been determined incompetent for that. So he can do that now, right? Um, he could also revoke the proxy to, to, or the power of attorney to Peter. He can still revoke it. Now, he may not want to do that, and in this particular case, he didn't, because the, the, Peter had been his, his partner at his business, right? And they were very close. And he was supposed to be the competent business guy, right? So, but, but if Paul and Mary Jr. can't get the, fa the dad to go that far, maybe at least they can get Paul or Mary Jr. Or, or, or get the father to give Paul and Mary Jr. a power of attorney also. So now they all have powers of attorney because that's okay. You can have more than one person with a power of attorney. So now Paul and Mary Jr. have the ability to go to the bank <clears throat> and get the dad's records and find out what's happened as far as the finances are concerned and can kind of figure this stuff out. Now ultimately, if the father refuses to, to, to dump the, Peter as the, on the power of attorney, you know, one possibility would be to go get a guardianship Right? And typically when people come in in this situation, that's what they're telling me they want to do. And I have to break the news to them. That's really hard. Getting a guardianship is really hard. First, you need to get a doctor, the doctor uh, in this case, who to determine that, that lit and in writing, in a document that gets filed with the court, that, that, Paul, or that Frank is, in, it has, is incapable of handling his own affairs and explaining all of that, right? And then there has to be a hearing, and there has to be a, a lawyer appointed for Frank, and, and the lawyer's fees all start running up, you know? And with these cases, on a contested case, ten, twenty thousand dollars not a lot of money to be spending on something like this. Same thing with a conservatorship. If you're going into court specifically to get, con to get control over the assets of someone, saying that they're, they've, they're, they're incompetent, the same kind of process happens. So those are really hard processes. So this notion of, of making 
what you, what you may want, what you may find yourself, that, that's what we were just talking about, so what you may want to find yourself doing if you want to avoid that is to name more than one person, as I had mentioned, on your power of attorney. Not that everybody has to act in, in concert in order for something to happen, because often logistically that becomes a nightmare. But that you have more than one person who has the ability to act on your behalf. So now let's take the opposite case. So let's say Peter really is the responsible kid. That's why they named him in the first place, because Paul and Mary Jr. are a little shaky, you know, have financial problems, maybe somebody's got a divorce, is under a lot of pressure. So here are the facts. Mary died. Uh, Peter, uh, who is the trustee, is financially secure. So in this case, um, Mary has died, so we've only got Frank alive. Uh, Peter is financially secure. Paul and, and Mary Jr. are both broke. Uh, Frank is frail. And, and, the, and Paul and Mary Jr. are like showing up at the house sometimes like, uh, Dad, you know, you know, can I have a loan? Or, you know, my house is being in foreclosed. Can I have $50,000? I've actually seen that figure change hands this year. $50,000? I need to be able to get on my feet again, blah, 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 right? And Peter is looking at all of this going, oh, God, what can I do? What can I do? So what we've talked to, 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 to Peter about doing that, because one of the things he's afraid of, and we've seen this happen, is that people are coming around to dad saying, well, you know, Peter's, you know, you really can't trust Peter, dad. You know, I mean, he's doing all this other stuff, and I think you ought to drop him as your attorney and name me, right? So what can Peter do? Well, one thing that we've suggested is what Peter can do is he can create a trust. Name himself as the trustee for the dad's benefit. Say right in the trust, following dad's death, Everything gets divided according to dad's will, or if dad has no will, according to the rules of intestacy, which means the kids all get a, would all get a third. So it is clear from the terms of the trust that Peter's not doing this asset shifting to benefit himself. Because then what we have Peter do, create the trust, I said, and then now you have the power of attorney. So using your power of attorney, take all the money, all the assets, transfer it to yourself as your trustee for your dad's benefit. Right? So it's clear that you're not stealing because the trust is just for your dad's benefit. And it's clear you're not trying to get a bigger cut after he dies because after he dies, you're just going to follow the last will and testament. And now, if Paul or Mary want to, now even if Peter's power of attorney gets revoked, he's still the trustee. He's still in control of the assets. If Paul or Mary now want to take an end run in order to get control, they have to go to court. And now they have to explain to the judge why it is that Peter can't be doing this job, right? So it's a handy way to resolve those issues. Um, mass health, one of the most common things that I talk to folks about, um, and especially for folks, you know, we're in the 70 and above, they're very concerned about nursing home care and oh my God, what happens? Um, nothing has changed regarding the mass health regulations over this year, except one thing, and I'll point it out a little bit later on. Um, the reason why I mention that is last year I came here and I said, a ton of things are going to change. And the reason for that was in November of 2016, MassHealth had proposed a comprehensive revision to their regulations regarding how people could qualify, uh, what would happen, how property would get leaned following their death, a whole bunch of stuff. And they said right in their notice in November of 2016, these will take effect in this or in a modified version by February of 2017. Well, here it is. It is May of 2018, only one change has occurred. And in the opinion of me and a number of my colleagues, there's nothing else that might, is going to happen. They're just, they're just, these regulations are just sitting around. So I'm going to talk to you about the one change. But basically, so to understand the change, you need to understand when I say nothing has changed. So this is the situation. You've, if you've been to these presentations, you've heard this before. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. Uh, if Frank and Mary, let's pretend those are their assets. They own a house worth 300,000, he's got an IRA worth 150, they got an annuity worth 100, he's got bank accounts of 75, total 625, Frank's got income of 2,000 a month, that's 1,500 a month from Social Security, 500 from pension, Mary's got income of 750 a month. Say Mary needs nursing home care today, what happens? Well, it's fairly straightforward, she can qualify for Mass Health almost immediately, and once she's qualified for Mass Health, She'll have to pay her income, and remember her income was only $750 a month, to the nursing home, and MassHealth will pay the rest. Um, um, she can qualify because while she cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets, 
Frank can own the home, no matter what its equity, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $123,600, and can have unlimited income. And so all that they have to do is shift all the assets to Frank today. And by the way, regarding uh, transfers between spouses, I always mention this, you never hear this on the radio, you never hear this. There is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. <clears throat> so this, literally, if Mary went to the nursing home today, she could shift everything, her, all of her joint interests in these properties to Frank the, tomorrow. And then Frank can keep up to 123,006. The rest of the money, and you'll recall he, they have more than 123,006, he can use to purchase an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. Um, and if Frank were 85 today, his life expectancy would be about eight years. The purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream because Frank can have unlimited income. He's just restricted in terms of his assets. So the day after he buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for mass health. At that point, she's going to be paying her $750, her, her Social Security, into, into the nursing home. And mass health is going to pay all the rest. And when Mary dies, there's going to be no lien on any of these assets. So the assets can still all go to the kids. There's one exception. And this is the change that occurred this past year. It had been until this year that when Frank bought that annuity, he could say in the annuity contract that if he died during the annuity term while those monthly payments were coming in to him, the remaining payments could all go to his kids or could go to anybody he wanted. That rule changed this year to make Massachusetts more consistent with most other states. The rule now is that if, Mary, if, Frank, excuse me, if Frank dies during that term, whether it's before or Mary has died, and, and Mary had, in the meantime, received MassHealth benefits. MassHealth will have a lien on the remaining payments to get repaid. And therefore, when, Mary, when Frank goes to buy that annuity, um, he now has a big incentive to make the annuity as short as possible. Because as long as, it sh as, it, as the money has come back to him, he has the ability to keep it protected. The reason for that is, I'm just going back to, the other, to this back slide, that that if he changes his will at the time that he does this stuff, or before, a lot of people, this is, what they, this is the planning they do when they're looking forward to the possibility of nursing home care. Um, if, he, if his will says that upon his death, the assets that would have gone to Mary, and remember their estate plan was that if one died, everything went to the other. The assets that would have gone to Mary instead go in trust for her benefit. And he can name one of the kids as the trustees. He can name anybody he wants. Then, as long, then whatever assets he owns at the time of his death, and remember in this case, all the assets you know, have been shifted to him, will be immediately protected. They will be non-countable as far as Mary is concerned. So if she's still alive, she can't get knocked off mass health. And they will be non-leanable following his death so, and following her death. So as long as in this annuity, he's made sure that all the payments coming to him will come back to him before he dies, and as long as they come to him before he dies, upon his death, everything is going to remain safe, non-countable and non-leanable. Uh, um, you cannot do the planning that I just described and also avoid the probate process because the, these, these assets have to be owned by Frank at the time of his death, need to go through Frank's will into a testamentary trust, a trust that is part of Frank's will, naming the kids or whoever as the beneficiaries. So Frank's asset and Mary's asset protection plan, if they were trying to do this ahead of time, would be, if people come in and talk to me about these issues, they say, well, make sure you've got these wills with the asset protection trust, do a power of attorney. If you're concerned that one of you might just drop dead before you can do asset shifting, then put the assets into that person's name. Somebody's got a heart condition, family history of people just dropping dead. You know, that, that said, once again, as I tell people, to remind people, when we were young, I see people here about my age, when we were young, a lot of people dropped dead. You know, you read about it in the paper. Somebody had a stroke, they died. Somebody had a, had a, had a heart attack, they died. Now, they mostly get saved because you got ambulances and these special emergency rooms and all this stuff, right? So the likelihood of that occurring is really small, which is why most people do this kind of planning and just leave their assets the way they are. But I tell them, if somebody gets sick, call me. 
call me and then we can do any of the asset shifting we need to do. We don't, the, last, the only thing you don't want to have to do at the last minute is write a new will. Um, so I've talked to all about this as far as, well, what happens if the two of them are alive? What happens if Frank has died? Um, so stay tuned on that. The, the, this is Elder Law 101 and the next one's Elder Law 102. Um, I can't remember when that's happening. I don't know if anybody here knows. It's, 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 it's before June. May 29th. May 29th. So on May 29th, I'm going to talk about how all of this affects you if you're single. Okay? Either, you know, widowed, divorced, just, or just plain old single. Um, so income and gift taxes. The interesting thing about uh, gift taxes, and we're going to talk about this effectively, there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax. Now many of you here may say, but wait a minute. What about if I give more than $15,000 to somebody? Is, doesn't something bad happen? Have you ever heard that? Right? Doesn't something bad happen? And I'll, and I'll say to people, so what do you think bad happens? Well, no one knows. They just know that if you give more than $15,000, something bad happens. And the answer is nothing bad happens. Nothing bad happens. Something, there used to be an issue because of the federal gift and estate tax. I don't think I'm going through that at all today. But there is no Massachusetts, but that's irrelevant now because the, the estate that you can, uh, be, so first of all, there's no Massachusetts gift tax, okay? And by the way, the, rec and the receipt of a gift is not income. So if you give money to your kids, say, and they get it, they don't have to report that, right? They, they just get it, right? So there is, federally, there is a combined gift and estate tax system. The way the system works is, if you have an estate, you die today, and you have a taxable estate of more than, a little more than $11 million, then uh, you pay an estate tax. If during your lifetime you make any gifts to one person in one year of more than $15,000, you're supposed to tell the federal government that. And the reason is so that the extra can be subtracted from the amount you can give at death. So if you gave one of your kids $115,000 today, Next April, you're supposed to file a gift tax return that tells that to the federal government. So they can take the extra 100000 the amount over fifteen, and subtract it from the $11 million that you can give at death. So now you can only give $10,900,000 at death. So as you can see, this is totally irrelevant to everybody, right? So you can give like pretty much as much as you want. Not pretty much. You can give as much as you want. There's one exception. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, the only thing that you may not, the only time you may not want to make those gifts, you can give them a million dollars. I had a couple that came in, they have $4 million, they have two sons, and, and they, they said, we don't need $4 million, these folks are older, you know. They said, we want to give away $2 million, what's that going to cost us? I said, nothing. Just give a million to one, give a million to the other, nothing, it's all fine. The only issue is, um, <coughs> when you're giving appreciated property, property that you had bought low and that is now worth more, you are also giving the person you're giving the gift to your tax basis in that property. What does that mean? So if, if so I just want, this is a, a brief piece on taxation. So say Frank and Mary sell their house and say they bought it for $50,000 and say they sell it for $300,000. They have a capital gain. What is a capital gain? A capital gain is the difference between the sale price and their basis and their basis in, the, in a case where it's like a house, they haven't rented it out or anything. Their basis is their purchase price. So in this case, their capital gain would be $300,000 minus $250,000. So there would, except for the, their, their special exemption, be a capital gains tax. Capital gains tax, federal is about 15, state's about five, about 20%. So the capital gains tax here would be about $50,000. Now, because they have lived in this house for at least two, for two of at least the, la of the last five years, um, they get an exemption from that capital gain of $250,000 a piece, a total of $500,000. So they wouldn't actually pay a tax. But if they gave the house to the kids, they, gave, they would be giving the, the kids their basis, the $50,000. If the kids turn around and sell the house, whether before or after their parents die, they will pay the capital gains tax, which will be about $50,000. Um, if, on the other hand, the parents keep the house until they die, and then it goes to the kids, then there is a rule that, that the, because the, the house is included in the estate at the fair market value, 
Therefore, for capital gains purposes, the basis also jumps to the fair market value. So if they die owning the house worth $300,000 and the kids sell the house the next day, they don't pay a capital gain because the sale price minus the new basis, the stepped up basis, is zero. Okay? So there may be a reason if for, for regarding real estate and regarding stock, the two things that you bought low and may sell high, for you to want to hold those assets until you die just so that your kids, when they sell them, aren't going to pay a big capital gains tax, right? But that aside, you can pretty much give away whatever you want. The medical deduction for seniors. I want to talk about this a little bit. The medical deduction as a result of the fabulous new uh, Tax Reduction Act this year um, actually increased your medical deduction. Um, your medical deduction now applies to the extent that you, uh, get, that you spend on, on medical expenses more than 7.5% of your income. It used to be more than 10% of your income. This number actually went down as a result of a wonderful, as a wonder, the, the wonderfulness of Susan Collins. Senator Susan Collins from Maine, one of the great senators right now, a Republican senator from Maine, wonderful. So now you may think to yourself, but you know, when would you ever spend that much on, on medical? Well, actually, the reason why Susan Collins got, Collins got involved in this was because of her concern about folks who need nursing home care, or who need a lot of care at home, people who are really sick. And so when you're thinking about the medical deduction, think about this. The deduction also applies to qualified long-term care services. What are they? They are services, first of all, to a person who has a disability. What's a disability? A disability is you need substantial assistance with two ADLs, eating, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing, continence, or substantial supervision for health or safety. Um, like, do you need it every day? Not necessarily. You just need a substantial amount. Who decides what's a substantial amount? Your licensed healthcare practitioner. Could be your doctor, could be a nurse, could be a geriatric care manager. These folks are like around a lot. Could be a social worker, right? If they think that you're disabled, right, then you're disabled, right? So you file your tax return and you've got this little certificate that says this. Now, so, so once you're disabled, the question is now what, what, is, a, what is a medical deduction? Uh, any necessary diagnostic, by the way, necessary, who says necessary? Necessary is your, what your nurse or the social or whatever says is necessary. Any necessary diagnostic, preventive, therapeutic, curing, treating, mitigating, yeah, yeah, rehabilitative services, and maintenance and personal care. Maintenance and personal care, right? Home care workers, whether they're your relatives that you're paying, whether they're friends, whether they're agencies, these are all legitimate personal, these are all legitimate expenses if you're disabled um, and these services are being provided um, uh, pursuant to a plan that's been written by your healthcare professional, whether that's the nurse or the social worker or whatever. Furthermore, if you're in an assisted living facility and, and you've gone there because your doctor has advised it because he thinks it's efficacious, what does that mean? You know, it means it's going to help you a little. Doesn't have to be the only reason you go, but it's going to help you, right? If it's the principal, but not but the, not the only reason for residing at the facility, then your entire monthly assisted living bill is a medical deduction. Imagine that, right? Now, if you're if so, when you're thinking about this in terms of your own funds, what that really means, if you're in that assisted living facility or you're getting a lot of services at home. This is the ideal time to use those tax deferred funds that you have, whether it's, you know, sell the cottage on the Cape, you know, or sell the stock or use your IRA or your 401k money. Because typically when you think about those assets, you think, well, geez, I don't want to use those because I'm going to have to pay all this tax. But if you use them for these services, your medical deduction equals your, your, what, you, what you're using. So you pull $100,000 out of your IRA in order to pay the assisted living bill, you, got you get a $100,000 medical deduction because of, of the assisted living or everything over 7.5% of your income. So it's a tremendous benefit. Second possibility is giving the money away. Let me just talk about that for a while. So suppose you say to yourself, suppose you don't have those, these big potential deductions. Um, 
um, but, you, but you're stuck with the bill. You know, you know you've got to be in assisted living or you need a lot of care. So what if in that case, Frank and Mary had this money and they just gave it to their son, Peter, and say, and, and, and then Peter paid the bill, <clears throat> the nursing home bill. Now, how could he do that? Well, if a, if a taxpayer is paying more than 50% of the expenses of a qualified relative, which includes parents, also includes aunts and uncles, by the way, includes grandparents, right? Then that person, for purposes of taking the medical deduction, is a qualified dependent. And so in, if, if Frank and Mary give $100,000 to Peter, and Peter turns around and pays the assisted living bill of $100,000 a year, he gets a $100,000 medical deduction. So suppose Peter and his wife, in today's world, in 2018, earn um, um, about $165,000 a year. They are in a 22% federal tax bracket and a 5% approximately Massachusetts tax bracket, which means if they spend that $100,000 in assisted living, they're actually reducing their tax bill by $27,000. Now, if Peter's a good kid, you know, if he's one of those guys with the halo, then what he's going to do with that money that he didn't spend on taxes is he's going to keep saving it for his parents. And so he has effectively extended the, the amount that his parents have to spend on assisted living or other care, right, by 27%. See how all that works? So, of course, this only works if you trust Peter, right? You don't want to write that check to the kid that, you know, you don't think is going to use it for you. But, and, and, and so everybody doesn't have that option. So dealing with life after death, uh, not my problem. That's the one I kind of can't deal with. Um, dealing with the rema what remains. Well, what remains, first of all, are the remains. What are, the remains are what your body turns into when you're dead. Instead of it being your body, it's the remains. Uh, a couple of things that you should note about your remains. Um, your, your proxy, your proxy's power um, actually extends beyond your death and extends to his or her ability to give your organs to the uh, New England Organ Bank, which is located in Waltham. Um, to the extent that they think that they need anything of yours. So if, if you're concerned about that, you know, you, that happens whether you've signed on with the registry and have something on your license, that's all. It used to be that was the only time any of that happened, but now it happens like automatically that this, this can happen. So if you're concerned about your body being or any of it being donated, you should really talk to your proxy about that and make sure that they don't donate. it. Um, the rest of your body is under the control of your personal representative if you have a will and the personal representative wants to do it. Otherwise, um, the next of kin, your spouse or your children, if your spouse doesn't want to do it. N dividing up the assets. So um, if there are any assets <clears throat> that are owned individually by you at the time of your death, they're going to get divided up according to the terms of your will, or if there's no will, uh, according to the rules of intestacy. So in this case, in the Frank and Mary case, if one of them has died, the other one survives, then the other one dies. So there were all these assets that need to go through probate. Um, those assets, if Mary has no will, are going to be divided up exactly the way they would have been divided up if Mary did have a will. They're going to get divided equally among the kids. So you're not writing that will in order to make sure the assets get divided correctly. And, and by the way, the Commonwealth never gets the assets. Never, 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 never. Okay? And the reason for that is, if you die with money, there will always be a relative. Always, 100% of the time. I've been doing this for 41 years. They, they show up. Second cousins, once removed. They just find out. So never worry that it's going to go to the Commonwealth. If, if you want to change the rules, though, that I just described, well, those, those are the times when you want to will, where you want to say, when I die, if you don't want it to go directly to the kids. One of, and, uh, and, uh, oh, and, and, and that's where you might want to will. Now, or you may want to avoid probate entirely. Why do you want to avoid probate? The probate process is designed to make sure that the assets get divided up as you have specified in your will or according to the rules of intestacy. But the probate process, <clears throat> excuse me, is also designed to make sure creditors get paid, which is re the reason why it always takes at least a year to go through the probate process, because your creditors have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against these probate assets. So if you want to avoid that delay, if you want to avoid the legal expense of dealing with going through probate, which costs, used to cost more, it costs about $5,000 now, um, then you want to try to avoid probate. So how do you do that? Well, Frank and Mary 
like already have regarding their assets. If one of them dies, there will be no probate because the house is jointly owned, the bank account was jointly owned, and the other two assets, they were allowed to name death beneficiaries. They're, they're, they're his IRA, you can name a death beneficiary, and that annuity. Annuities always have a provision that you can name a death beneficiary. So the issue is then, what happens if Mary dies? Because in that case, there would be a probate unless Mary has taken steps to avoid it. The standard ways to avoid it, joint ownership, right? One thing that Mary could do is simply name the kids, or at least one of them, as a joint owner on the accounts and on the house. And, and presumptively, if you own something jointly, when you die, your interest evaporates, and the survivor or survivors become the sole owners of the property, and so there's no need for probate. Second way to do it is through a trust. You could create a revocable and amendable trust. Um, you could name yourself as the trustee. And once again, typically I'll say to people, you can do this while you're both alive if you want, um, and, and, and it will cover you. You don't really need to, though, until one of you is dead because when one of you dies, the other one's gonna own all the assets. So that's the point at which this issue becomes more of, a, of an issue. So you name yourself as the trustee, you name the kids as the beneficiaries and yourself, but you say that following your death, that there's another person who's gonna step in immediately as the new trustee. By structuring things that way and having you own your assets by deeding your house to yourself as the trustee and, deeding, and having any bank, large bank accounts name, name you that way, you are assuring that following your death, those assets will not go through probate and will therefore not be th subject to the one-year delay and subject to the legal expense. And instead, your new trustee, typically your child, can immediately step in and distribute all the money. Um, regarding household items, theoretically, your household items go through probate, but they, no one ever cares about this stuff. So, I mean, you don't have to worry about that. What's going to happen is your kids are going to divide them up. And if you're concerned about this, then just write a letter to your kids that says, here's who I want to get what. If you're very concerned, write a will that also says that, that says, here's how things are going to get divided up, knowing that as a result of that, if you die and any of the kids think they're going to be arguing about this, the one who's the personal representative under the will says, look, here are two possibilities. All we have left to divide up is my stuff, the stuff in the house. So we can either just divide it up or I can file this will in probate court, I can appoint, get appointed as the personal representative, and then we can just divide it up. So which one do you want to do? And then as a result, the will never gets probated. So that's the, it, the only other thing is the car. The car, you, what you probably want to do with the car is get somebody, if you're single, is to have somebody named jointly with you on the car so that when you die, the car will instantly go to that person. Now, your child may not want to do that because they may say, geez, Ma, you're a terrible driver. I don't want to be on it. In which case, you may have to increase your insurance, right, to convince the kid to be on the car. But the result of that is that it instantly goes to them. If you own the car individually and you're married, there's a special state statute that says that presumptively the surviving spouse is the joint owner. So you can just go to the surviving spouse, can just go to the registry with a death certificate and a marriage certificate, and they'll transfer it right away. Okay? Now, the little bit about the Massachusetts estate tax. <clears throat> I just want to go through this because this, this one has, there's a lot of confusion to, to this. So I want you to kind of understand this one. And it also contains this one small exception to my you can give it away rule. Um, the Massachusetts estate tax was created at about the same time the federal estate tax was created, like in the 1920s, you know, the era of the, all people were really accumulating a lot of wealth and there was a lot of kind of anger about that. And so, they created the estate tax. And so when the Massachusetts estate tax was created, um, it, 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 it taxed all estates over $40,000. Imagine that, $40,000, considered to be a lot of money, right? And what they did was at that time, they adopted this chart. And, they, and, they, and they, in the chart, they said, so basically, here are the graduated rates that you're going to pay in taxation. Uh, between, for all dollars between like $40,000 and $90,000, you're going to pay like eight-tenths of 1%. Between 90,000 and like 200,000, you're going to pay like 1.6%. They're very small numbers. Gradually, it went up. Um, the net effect of that was that, th that under that, the terms of that chart, and by the way, that chart is still in effect. That they've never changed the chart. Under the terms of that chart, if you had an assets of a million dollars, right, um, you would pay um, right now zero in estate tax. But the reason for that is, oh, I thought I had the chart. I thought I had a separate one. Never mind. So as a result of that chart, if you had an estate of a million dollars, 
you would pay an estate tax of around $38,000, right? So over time, uh, values started going up, especially house values. And, and, the, and the legislature it was responded to the fact that people were saying, geez, you know, I'm paying an estate tax. All I own is my house and a little bit of money. And so what they did was, instead of modifying the chart, they kind of drew a line and they said, okay, we'll change the law and we'll say that if your estate is worth, more than, is worth less than $60,000, you don't pay any estate tax. And eventually that changed to 100,000 and then to 500,000 and now it's a million. Million dollars or less, if you're a state, you don't pay any estate tax. But even though the chart is still in effect, right? So then the question is, what happens if you're a dollar over? Say, say if you have a million one dollars, do you, what do you pay? Well, in some states, and this was true in Rhode Island for many years and in other states, the estate tax was referred to as a cliff tax. There was this line that was drawn, and then if you went over the line, you fell off the cliff and you owed all the money that you would have paid according to the chart. In Massachusetts instead, they said, okay, we're gonna gradually eliminate the benefit so that once you get over a million dollars, we're gonna charge you an estate tax, the lower of what you would have paid under the chart or 40% of all the dollars above a million. So, now I can do my slide. If you're at a million dollars, you pay zero in estate tax. If you're at a million one hundred thousand dollars, you pay $40,000 in estate tax. So the marginal rate on that last $100,000 was 40%. You pay $40,000 of the last $100,000, right? Now, then it goes way down, though, because the point at which these lines cross, the line that's 40% of all the dollars over a million, and the line that is the chart, is about a million one hundred thousand, about $1,125,000. So, see, between a million one and a million two, the amount of tax only goes up by like 9,000 bucks, right? Between a million two and a million three, the amount of tax only goes up by like $6,000. So the tax is much smaller. It, it, it kind of evaporates. But if you're in that category around a million to a million one, you're very interested in this issue. So regarding estate tax avoidance, one of the things that I had said was you can always just give stuff away, right? Um, you can also, before you die, if you, if you, if you were, if Frank had died and Mary owned all of their assets, right, she wouldn't be paying an estate tax anyway. But say her, say her estate were worth a million five and she were getting really sick. She could simply tell her, and she had a power of attorney, she could simply tell her attorney, before I die, the day before I die, give all the assets to the kids. Give all the assets away to the kids. By doing that, she is turning her taxable estate into zero, which means that when she dies, she'll pay zero in estate tax, right? So there is, there is, that's one way to do it, right? Another way, there is a, 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 a way that you can do it through which basically you structure things so that whoever dies first, a piece of the assets that would have gone to the surviving spouse instead gets held in trust for the benefit of that surviving spouse, thereby reducing the amount that the surviving spouse has in their estate. By playing that game, even if you have an estate of up to $2 million, you can eliminate the estate tax. I'm not going to go into detail on that one today because that's, that's a whole other game. Um, so, covered a lot of material. Um, and obviously there are a lot of things that I could cover in more depth, but I wanted you to get a sense of a lot of these things. And if you're specifically interested in those issues as they relate to you, if you are single, please come to the next presentation. Any questions? Any questions? Mm, if not, Thank you very much for coming, and if you get a chance, I'll see you next time. Otherwise, I'll see you in the fall. Thank you. Mm -hmm.